And let's stand together and let's pray that we might be those instruments ready for His honor and glory. Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Isaiah. And as you're turning there, ushers, I want to make sure everyone received the book that was passed out. I, in the balcony, I don't know that they got the books. If someone could check on that. I saw a couple folks come in. And if you're in the, in the main auditorium, floor floor, raise your hand if you didn't get the book. Let me just see. All right. If you hold it up there for just a minute, uh, some of you uh, uh, will get that just coming your way right now. And just hold your hand up there. Up in the balcony, I saw some of you coming in that maybe did not receive one. And uh, I'll only ask that you not read the book while I preach. How's that for a deal, all right? And uh, we're going to get to the book at the end, but I do want to get that into your hands now. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be uh, using this as we share some of the vision at the later part of the service tonight. Isaiah chapter 57, and of course our theme verse from which I preach this morning is verse number 15. Isaiah 57, 15. And I want you to follow with me as I read this verse now uh, for our evening uh, message time. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of of the contrite ones. Would you read this verse with me, please? Ready, begin. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for the way you have begun working. And Lord, we pray for revived hearts. We pray that as we study the meaning of revival, that you would convict us and move us. And Lord, we pray that through this process of purging and growing and worshiping you, that we would grow into the likeness of Christ, that we would return to our first love, and that we may see the greater works that you have in store for our lives and for our church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we learned that in Isaiah chapter 56 and 57, God through his prophets is speaking to the children of Israel, specifically to the southern tribe of Judah. He presents for us in the Word of God that these particular people, especially surrounding Jerusalem, had become disobedient, and now they were hearing the indictments of the prophet against them. It was the godless conduct of even the leaders of the people, even the priests, that was now bringing the imminent judgment of God upon the people. The Bible speaks of it in Lamentation chapter 4. And verse 13, where we read, For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. The Bible speaks of the sins of the prophets, the iniquities of the priests. They had intermingled their worship with the worship of the pagan peoples around them. And God was displeased. We know from the Word of God, Exodus chapter 20, the Lord our God is a jealous God. He desires our full attention. He desires our worship. Had the prophets and priests, had the rulers turned to God in repentance and faith, He would have intervened on their behalf. He would have not allowed calamity to come into their life. He would have given them a way out. But instead, they persisted in their rebellion. Their hearts became hardened and calloused. Their consciences were defiled. Publicly and privately, the people were devoted to idolatry and immorality. Many of us tonight sit in this place, having been raised and influenced by the families we were raised in, by the culture all around us. And many times it's very easy to just bend with the culture. And revival is not about bending with the culture. 
It is about leaning towards God. It is about obeying the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, many people in Judah were just kind of leaning with the cultures around them and the influences around them, and they had turned off the voice of God. They were not listening to the message of the prophets. With all of this as a bad news backdrop, there's still good news for the people of God because God has a word of encouragement for the faithful remnant, for those that would repent and turn to Him. God had built a spiritual highway where obstacles could be removed and where exiles might return into the land. And ultimately, that spiritual highway would become a literal highway because as the people repented, they would even be returning back from Babylon into Judah and Jerusalem. You see, the problem really began when their lifestyle and even their worship really became simply a matter of religious duty. You see, ritual and ceremony had a significant place in Israel's worship. But faith was not summed up or found in their ritual. And tonight as we enter this new year, we must recognize that God desires reality, not ritual. There's nothing wrong with certain rituals. We have habits and patterns even in our own church. They bring order, and these are fine But when we become ritualistic in just doing what we do and keeping the schedule and thinking that that will produce godliness, then we are following a pattern that can lead to powerlessness. Perhaps there were those who thought that since they kept the religious rituals of the law, uh, that it was all right to dabble in the other sins and religions around them. But God is saying to His people, My desire is not simply your ritualism. My desire is real worship from the heart. And so through Isaiah, he calls them back and he invites them in verse number 15. And he says, I'm willing to fellowship with those that have a contrite, a remorseful, and a humble spirit. Even though there are many proud that are around, even though there are many scorners in the midst, for anyone that would humble themselves, any of my people, that will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and call upon my name, I will revive them. I will fellowship with them. And so we introduced this morning the theme of this year, which is the hope of this year. It is the hope of America. It is the hope of this church. It is the hope of every family. And that is returning to our first love, May I say to you tonight, you may have a very conservative geopolitical position. You may have a very conservative outlook on life. You may have a very faithful attendance record in church. And you may have all of the right uh, crossing of the T's and dotting of the I's, even in the wonderful word fundamentalist. But may I say to you tonight that having all of the right position and all of the outward disposition without a revived heart, and we are a powerless people to see anything good for God. And so this morning, we begin studying the subject of revival using an acrostic of the word revive. And we learned this morning that no revival has been recorded in Scripture, whether at Ephesus, uh, whether with Jonah and Nineveh, Jonah had to repent, whether in the revivals that you'll read about in the book given to you tonight. No revival has ever been recorded without, first of all, repentant hearts, people that suddenly, remorsefully, turned from their sin, having a fresh glimpse of God, and were willing to repent. We said this morning that repentance is the vomiting of self. It's getting to that place where we see God so high and so holy that we realize that we have been taking for granted His wonderful grace. We have been living lives that are displeasing and powerless in His eyes. Repentance is the first step in any revival. And repentance is shown in many ways. It may be the simple prayer that we pray tomorrow morning. It may be at the altar tonight. It may be some husband going to his wife and repenting of sin or a wife to a husband. It may be a rebellious teenager apologizing to a school teacher. It may be one man in this room to another. I have no idea. But it's always repentance toward God. It's always recognizing as David did in his great repentant prayer of Psalm 51. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And we must not fall prey to the idea of the world. 
that if no one finds out, then it's okay. We must recognize that God is always observing and God is calling us to repentance. We saw the importance of repentance. And then secondly, we learned about the importance of exalting Christ. That when revival comes, there is a turning away remorsefully from that which displeases the Lord. And there's a renewed desire to exalt the Lord. And to personally and corporately lift up His name and worship Him and love Him and walk with Him and talk with Him. We said thirdly this morning then that a repentant heart will not only want to exalt Christ, but that it will also be a heart that greatly values Christ. A heart that values Christ. And, and we said that the wonderful thing about being saved and the wonderful thing about knowing the Lord is our relationship with the Lord. We said that many have a relationship with the church. And some who have come out of the Roman Catholic Church might say that they had a relationship with the church and as long as they kept the sacraments of the church, everything was okay. And, and yet, we're thankful tonight our relationship is not with the church, it's with the living Savior. How many of you are thankful for that tonight? And yet, while we have that relationship, the question tonight is, how's that relationship going? Are you putting great value on the relationship? Will you, in the morning when you rise, say, give me Jesus? Do you open his word? Do you really value the fact that he's your personal savior? Do you talk with him? Do you think about his gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection? And do you live out his gospel in your life, recognizing the necessity of being dead to self and alive to Jesus Christ. Do you ever think about when you were baptized, besides the fact that the water was cold, or besides the fact that you had to wear a funny gown or your wig fell off? Do you ever remember what someone tried to tell you? This is a picture of how you can have victory the rest of your life. Death to the old man, resurrection to the new man, alive in Jesus Christ. Place great value on this life in Jesus Christ. That's what baptism represents. Not only the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, but the death, burial, and resurrection of you. Placing value on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so revival comes with repentant hearts who then recognize the desire to exalt Christ and to place great value again on the relationship with Christ. Returning back to the place of your salvation, the joy of your salvation. Recognizing it's not up to your husband to make you happy. It's not up to your wife to make you happy. The Bible teaches us that David said he encouraged himself in the Lord. Someone said, I always thought if I married the right person, then I would just be happy if I just married the right person. Friend, it's not about marrying the right person. It's about being the right person. God's calling us not to look at our spouse or our friend or the church member or some other situation, but to look within our own hearts and our own relationship with Jesus Christ and to place great value upon it this year. Tonight I share with you the fourth characteristic of revival. Again, not to say that we can program revival, not to say that if we do this we'll have revival. Really what I'm preaching to you today is that when we have repentance and when revival comes, these are some things that I believe we will see. And the fourth characteristic that I have read about in the revivals in Wales and China, in the revivals that have swept throughout portions of Europe and throughout our own country, is intercessory prayer. When revival comes, there will be a great movement of prayer that is evident. There will be people praying, perhaps individually, perhaps with a friend, perhaps within their Sunday school class, perhaps from the orchestra or the choir, or just a group of ushers that come a, a little bit early. You know, God has given me certain administrative gifts and sometimes I have to pull myself back from not trying to overly use them in the sense of organizing certain things. And I have learned, if there's one thing I cannot organize, it's the moving of God. 
I would be foolish to think that if I organized 50 separate prayer meetings. Now, we're going to call the church to prayer. I do believe the pastor is responsible to provide this leadership and to provide opportunities for prayer and learning and edification and worship. But I'm, what I'm saying to you is that when revival comes, the Holy Spirit begins to pull people together into a heart for prayer, to pray for one another. And intercession is when we pray for one another. It's when we pray for that wayward child. It's when we pray for that hurting couple. It's when we pray for ourselves. It's when we pray that God would heal a broken community. 1 Timothy 2 and 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Sometimes I think about people whose lives have been recorded in ruin. I think about people who've gone AWOL. I think about preachers that I've known that have fallen from the ministry since I began some 35 years ago in the ministry. And one thing I think about, I never think about the gory details of the sin, and I do not think with a condemning heart, because I believe the church should always have a heart for restoration. But one thing I think about is this. Did I pray for that member enough? I wonder if anyone prayed for that evangelist. You know, it's easy to talk about who fell and all the gory details. It's not so easy to pray for them. When revival comes, we're not as interested in the gossip of failure. We're more interested in the preventive ministry of intercessory prayer. We're more interested in praying for those who have need. And so we pray, first of all, for revival in our church. And may I say that relying on God has to begin every day as if nothing has ever been done before. To rely upon God is to begin every day as if nothing has ever happened before in the sense of a miraculous way. It is to say, Lord, I do not want to ride on the miracles of yesterday. I do not want to ride on the answered prayers of yesterday. I need to see answered prayer today. Some of us have relied upon God in the past. What is 2018? It is relying upon God in the present. It is seeking God in prayer in the present. Habakkuk 3 and 2. O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Some of you are in the midst of your years. You're at midlife. You're at a point of perhaps weariness. Perhaps you've seen it all out on the street. Perhaps you've seen uh, difficulties and hypocrisy and and just enough to kind of take the shine, the glow off of your life. Habakkuk says, Lord, sometimes we need revival in the midst of our years because we don't want a midlife burnout. We want to rekindle and finish strong in the second half for Jesus Christ. And we pray this way, Lord. I pray for this brother who's been faithful for a long time. Lift his burden. Give him a second wind. Lord, thank you for that couple. They've been married 30 years. God bless them and strengthen them. And when revival comes, there's an intercessory prayer. Pastor R.G. Lee, who founded and pastored Bellevue Baptist Church, said this of revival. It may be in your notes. He said, revival, if... If all the sleeping folks wake up, if all the lukewarm folks fire up, if all the dishonest folk will confess up, if all the disgruntled folk will cheer up, if all the depressed folk will cheer up, if all the estranged folk will make up, if all the gossipers will shut up, if all true soldiers will stand up, If all the dry bones will shake up, if all the church members will pray up, then we can have revival. I concur. Praying in the church, increased intercessory prayer, will always be one of the indicators that revival has come. Oh, that we would be a people of prayer this year. That we would take the prayer list on Wednesday night and not let it be something found at the bottom of the seat by the next Wednesday night. That we would create our own prayer lists. 
that we would pray instantly, in season, continuously, out of season, walking in prayer. But not only will there be prayer for revival in the church and for folks in the church and for folks in your Sunday school class who have needs, but there will be prayer, secondly, for our co-laborers. 1 Timothy 2 and 1, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. May I encourage you on this first Sunday of the year to develop a prayer list. May I kindly request a place on that prayer list. May we learn to pray for one another. May you learn to pray as a family on Saturday night and Sunday morning for pastor, for your Sunday school teacher, for those that would sing, for those that would give forth the word of God, that we would pray for our co-laborers, that we would learn how to bring these names before the Lord, and that we would ask God to give anointing and give freedom. We ought to begin praying now. Not only should we sign up on the prayer sheet for the week of awakening, but just in your own prayer, praying for the week of awakening, praying for Dr. Getch, that the Lord would give utterance. Revival in the church is needed. Prayer for revival in the church. Prayer uh, for our co-laborers. And then, of course, we must always pray with thanksgiving. We do not intend to be unthankful for the revival of the past nor for the blessings of the past. Philippians 4, 6, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. When revival comes, we will see first of all repentance. We will hear of those that have made things right. We'll hear of some that could care less what others think and they will apologize for sin. We'll hear of some that get saved. We'll hear of some that make decisions that Somebody might say, wow, I can't believe they made that. But because revival has come, you can believe it and you're glad they made that decision. Repentance, exalting of Christ, greater value on Christ, and fourthly, interceding in prayer. There's a spirit of prayer before and during the revival. And then, for, uh, fifthly, this evening, the, the letter V is for the word Volunteer. When revival comes, there's no longer a pleading. There's no longer a working up of emotion. There is a volunteer spirit that is of the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you the best example I can from the book of Isaiah. Look, if you would, at Isaiah chapter 6, if you would turn there just for a moment. Let's see a man having a one-man revival. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 1. Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Again, revival comes when we have a picture of the holiness of God, when we recognize that we have trampled upon the holiness of God, when we forget that God has said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up, and and, and he hears this cry, Holy, holy, holy. Verse 4, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now we see the repentance. Here we see a man that has a glimpse of God. He now is repenting. He says, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm unclean. I'm unworthy to stand here. None of us, by the way, are worthy to stand in the presence of God. It's only by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Isaiah tells us in verse 7, verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. How many of you are thankful that your sin is purged tonight? By the grace of God. And so Isaiah is experiencing a one-man revival. Here's the time of repentance. Here's a time when he's greatly valuing God's presence. 
Here's a time uh, when he is witnessing the holiness of the Lord. And what is his response to all of this? In verse number 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. He didn't read it in the bulletin. There wasn't an announcement made. It wasn't a Sunday school teacher or the soul winning director. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a fresh glimpse of who he is and who God is. And when he realized the wonderful grace of Jesus and when he heard there might be a need, he said, here I am, here I am. I want to be a part. Lord, send me. I'll do whatever you want me to do. A one man Revival. When revival comes, you want to serve the Lord. It's your desire to be a part of His work. And then I want you to notice in this passage, Isaiah is purified in verse 6, but volunteers in verse number 8. He says, here am I, Lord. Let me give you just a few thoughts on volunteering for the Lord. First of all, when revival comes, we will realize it is a privilege to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm convinced that instrumentalists and musicians and teachers and preachers and all of us who serve the Lord, all of us who have that first love uh, to be a part and singing and preaching and praying and serving, it, it can become something of a routine if we're not careful. Sometimes we just kind of start going through the motions. And when revival comes, suddenly we realize, you know, I may not have 10 or 20 more years on this life. It's a privilege to do this. I'm so thankful to God that I can preach and sing and witness and serve and coach and help and cook and teach and be a mom and be a dad and do it all under the Lord. Suddenly when revival comes, the mundane Dane becomes special again. I saw a video recently of Senator John McCain speaking right after he had his surgery to remove or to take a biopsy of a brain tumor. And uh, whether you care for John McCain or not is not the point. The point I want you to see is that he is a man who unquestionably loves his country. I have a hard time with anyone that would speak against a prisoner of war for our country. But I want you just to take a moment and try to capture as he speaks his heart just about serving our country. And just think about this with me for a moment. What a great honor and extraordinary opportunity it is to serve in this body. It's a privilege to serve with all of you. I mean it. Many of you have reached out in the last few days with your concern and your prayers. And it means a lot to me. It really does. I've had so many people say such nice things about me recently that I think some of you must have me confused with someone else. <laughs> I appreciate it, though, every word, even if much of it isn't deserved. I'll be here for a few days. I hope managing the floor debate on the defense authorization bill, which I'm proud to say is again a product of bipartisan cooperation and trust among the members of the Senate Armed Services Committee. After that, I'm going home for a while to treat my illness. I have every intention of, re of returning here and giving many of you cause to regret all the nice things you said about me. <laughs> and I hope to impress on you again that it is an honor to serve the American people in your company. When I heard that, I could not help but sense the reality of his conviction that it is an honor to serve the American people. And it is an honor. And thank God for those who serve the American people. But when revival comes, you will once again realize the high and holy honor of serving the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You will realize the great privilege of being involved and volunteering to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll have the spirit again of John 6 and 9, the little lad that had the barley loaves and the fishes, and, and he brought them to Jesus. And the spirit of the psalmist in Psalm 116 who said, What shall I render unto the Lord for all of the benefits he has given toward me? In other words, I, there's not enough that I could do for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when revival comes, we'll return to that servant's heart for even 
even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And just think about it tonight. Think about the revival that brought Lancaster Baptist into being. And think about the many times when God would touch and when God has moved in our midst. And whether it was Dr. Hudson in 1994 and 1995 or other meetings where the Lord just began to purge and save and touch and, and restore. How did that happen? It happened by the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the responses was people that became involved in helping to set up school and turning wrenches and, and building and witnessing and cooking and loving and caring and driving buses and going to camps and being involved in missionary outreaches. And, and all of this has not been the product of some manufactured leadership style. It has been the product of revival. And we must have a fresh anointing of God if we'll see a fresh volunteerism for God. When revival comes, there's an understanding of the privilege to serve. Oh, you say, but pastor, it's getting rough in California. Oh, I didn't know that our job was just to try to have revival amongst those that already have many Baptist churches. I didn't know that you only needed revival uh, in places where there's an abundance of conservatism. I thought maybe it might be a good thing if revival could actually happen in a place like California. I understand, folks. I know where we live. I know who the governor is. I know they've legalized pot. I, I want you to understand, however, tonight, I'm thankful for missionaries in Africa who weren't missionaries just until it got a little bit different. Difficult. And then they said, I'm going to move back to Oklahoma where I can just uh, settle in and, and just do some things my own way. I want to recognize tonight the need that we have in our lives. And once we recognize that, the need to volunteer so that others might see the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know some of you, even in law enforcement, you see the worst of the worst. And sometimes in the ministry we see that as well. And it might be easy to become cold and, and calloused and it might be easy to just say, I'm done with this. But I believe tonight that when volunteerism comes, you realize, hey, you know what? There might be a teenager I can rescue from the perishing and save from the dying. And there might be somebody out there that I could touch their life with the grace of God. And they'll not have to experience some of what I've seen when I've made those calls and seen uh, those difficulties. And we must have a revived heart in order to maintain passion and in order to maintain a viability of ministry in 2018. And I want to encourage you tonight, the world not becoming a better and better place. It will be when Jesus comes again, but we can make this corner of the world a better place by the grace of God. We can see God do revival in our hearts and lives, but we will see when it comes, we'll return to a servant's heart will remember the eternal reward. Can I remind you of something? Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. I want you to see this and live with this in mind. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. There is coming a day when we will all stand before the Lord and we'll have opportunity to render unto Him the rewards that have been given. We'll be able to lay those down at His feet for we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we will certainly then understand, wow, what a privilege it was to be a doorkeeper in the house of God. What a privilege it was to pray. What a privilege it was to give a gospel tract. What a privilege it was to help a missionary. I'm so glad that during my life and during this service at Lancaster Baptist Church that my heart stayed revived enough so that my life stayed volunteering enough so that I could hear Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Live with that day in mind. Revived people live with the thought of Christ coming in mind and they realize the privilege and because of that they remain faithful. They remain faithful in service. Luke 19, 17, he said unto him, Well, thou good, and thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. 
God says there's coming a day when I will reward the faithful. I will give them a part of the kingdom, the millennial kingdom. They'll rule and reign with me. And I just am simply saying it's a privilege tonight to serve the Lord. And if you've lost the wonder of it all, and if it's sometimes just a drudgery, then maybe you need to be revived. And maybe there does need to be some repentance and some reevaluation of the relationship with the Lord and the privilege of it all. And maybe there needs to come into our lives more prayer so that we'll get back to the matter of volunteering and recognizing it is a privilege to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, every revival that I have studied, not only do you find repentance at the very beginning, not only do you see people exalting Christ, not themselves, not only do you see people personally valuing Christ and Not only do you find people in this revival time interceding for one another, and not only do you find people volunteering, but you always hear of people getting saved. You hear of the evangelization of the lost. A hundred thousand in Wales, thousands in China, thousands in Korea. Every revival has, as the fruit of the revival, souls that are saved. We must evangelize our community with a believing heart. Isaiah 55 and verse 11 says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing thereto I sent it. We must, with a believing heart, continue to spread the gospel. You say, oh, hearts are so hardened. I I hate to pop your bubble here. But God can take some stoned out guy that's on drugs and get him at the right moment and get the word of God into his heart. And God can still save those people. I hate to pop your bubble here, but God can save someone that's not like you. In fact, he didn't come for the the whole. He came for the sick. And we need to have a believing heart again that the power of the gospel can touch these lives and can make a difference in this community. And with a believing heart, we enter the new year. And with a sincere heart, for the Bible says, he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Oh, it's time that we would receive a passion from the Lord and that ministry would flow from our hearts to our hands and that with revived hearts we would say, Lord, help us to be walking in the Spirit. I was with Brother Furso the other day visiting over at Brother Sombrano's house. It was a day that was very busy on the schedule and we needed to go by and yet I was hoping that we might see someone saved that day. There was a young man in the house, Michael, friend of the family. We prayed with Brother Phil. We just stopped and spoke to Michael. The Lord just impressed upon my heart to speak to him about his condition. Just to ask him if he knew if he died, if he would go to heaven. 21-year-old single adult. He did not know. Just ask him, could we show you from the Bible? He said, sure. We sat down and went through Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8. Went through John chapter 3, went through Ephesians 2. And after about 30 minutes, Michael prayed to accept Christ as Savior. Oh, sometimes the devil wants us to think, you know, everybody behind those doors, they're all hardened hearts and they're all crooked and they're all mean and they're all the big bad wolf and none of them want to talk and none of them want to know about God and they're probably all in there smoking marijuana right now. There's a lot of them that just need somebody to tell them that God loves them, that Jesus died for them. And when revival comes, in every account I've read of revival, people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because revived people talk about Jesus. And communities hear about Jesus anew and afresh. And so we see the need for revival tonight. We see this definition and we see these six characteristics. And I want you to say them with me tonight. We see that revival is indicated with six characteristics. The first one is... And then we begin to, and personally, we value Christ. And then fourthly, we begin to what? 
intercede for one another. And, and as we're interceding, the Spirit of God, because of renewed love for the Lord, we begin to do what? We begin to... And, and then we cannot help but evangelize and tell others about the Lord and all that He has done for us.